Autumn Floods The time of the autumn floods had come and all the streams were pouring into the great river. The expanse of its unobstructed flow was so great that a horse on the other bank could not be distinguished from a cow. The river god was overjoyed, delighting in his own powers, believing all the world's beauty now to be encompassed within himself. Flowing eastward, he arrived at the northern sea. Casting his gaze toward the east, he saw no end to the waters. It was then that his face began twisting and turning, a whirlpool of features in his attempt to take the sea in his sights. He addressed Rua of the Northern Sea with a sigh. There is a saying in the Outlands, he who hears the course a mere hundred times believes no one can compare with him. This describes me perfectly. When I first heard that there are those who belittle the erudition of Confucius and the conscientiousness of Bo Yi, I didn't believe it. But now I have seen your vastness with my own eyes. If I had never come here to your gate, I might have become a laughingstock to the masters of the great method. Rua of the Northern Sea said, You cannot discuss the sea with a well turtle, for he is limited in space. You cannot discuss ice and snow with a summer insect, for he is fixed in his own time. And you cannot discuss the course with a nook and corner scholar, for he is bound by his doctrines. Now that you have emerged from your dusty banks and had a look at the great ocean, you finally realize how hideous you are. Only now can you understand anything about the great guideline. There is no body of water in the world larger than the ocean. All the rivers revert to it ceaselessly, yet it is not filled. It leaks away at Weilu continuously, yet it is not emptied. Unchanging in both spring and autumn, it is unaffected by either floods or droughts. Its superiority to all the streams and rivers is beyond calculation, but I have never for this reason thought much of myself. For if I compare myself to all the creatures taking shape between heaven and earth and receiving vital energy from the yin and yang, I see that my position between heaven and earth is like that of a small stone or a tiny weed on a vast mountain. Having this insight into my insignificance, what conceit could I have? For are not the four seas calculated against the space between heaven and earth like a swirling hollow on the surface of a vast lake? Is not the Middle Kingdom calculated against all the known world, like a single grain of rice lost in a granary? We number the types of creatures at 10,000, and man is but one of them. And even in the nine regions crowded with humans, where they are able to grow their crops and ride their boats and carriages, a single person is just one among the throng. Among the 10,000 things, is not the human realm like the tip of a hair on the body of a horse? What the five emperors unified, what the three hegemons fought for, what the humane men worry themselves about, what the diligent knights labor themselves for, is nothing more than this. Bowie was considered worthy of fame for renouncing no more than this. Confucius was considered erudite for talking about no more than this. Such was their conceit. Does it not resemble your previous conceit over your waters? The river god said, then I should consider heaven and earth large, and the tip of an autumn hair small, is that right? Rua of the Northern Sea said, not at all. For there is no end to the comparative measuring of things, no stop to the changing times, no constancy to the ways things can be divided up, no fixity to their ends and beginnings. Thus, when a person of great wisdom contemplates both the far and the near, he does not find what is small to be too little nor what is great to be too much, for he knows that comparative measurings are endless. Witnessing the totality of ancient and modern times, he does not find the lofty and distant to be dispiritingly great nor the cramped and nearby to be in need of improvement, for he knows that the temporal changes of things are endless. Understanding their fillings and emptyings, he can gain them without joy and lose them without sorrow, for he knows that there is no single constant way of dividing them up. Comprehending their juttings and flattenings, he does not rejoice in finding himself alive nor bemoan his death, for he knows that there can be no fixity to their endings and beginnings. What man knows is far less than what he does not know. The time he exists is insignificant compared to the time he does not exist. It is because he tries to exhaust this vastness with this meagerness that he bewilders and frustrates himself. From this point of view, how can we know that the tip of a hair can delimit the ultimate measure of smallness, or heaven and earth the fullest expanse of vastness? The river god said, the debaters of the world say, the most minute and subtle has no physical form, and the largest and coarsest is unencompassable. Is this correct? 
Rua of the Northern Sea said, looking at the large from the viewpoint of the small, it appears inexhaustible. Looking at the small from the viewpoint of the large, it appears indistinct. The subtle is the minutest of the small, and the limiting circumference is the vastest of the large. So it is sometimes convenient to differentiate between them as determined by the situation. But both the subtle and the coarse are limited to the realm of things with definite form. What has no form can be distinguished by no quantities. What cannot be encompassed can be exhausted by no quantities. What can be discussed in words is just the coarser aspect of things. What can be reached by thought is just the subtler aspect of things. But what words cannot describe and thought cannot reach cannot be determined as either coarse or subtle. So the conduct of the great man harms no one, but he places no special value on humanity and kindness. His actions are not motivated by profit, but he does not despise those who slavishly subordinate themselves to it. He does not fight over wealth, but he places no special value on yielding and refusing it. He doesn't depend on others, but he places no special value on self-sufficiency. He does not despise the greedy and corrupt, and though his own conduct is unconventional, he places no special value on eccentricity and uniqueness. His actions do not follow the crowd, but he does not despise the obsequious flatterers. All the honors and stipends in the world are not enough to goad him into doing anything, and all its punishments and condemnation are not enough to cause him shame, for he knows that right and wrong cannot be definitively divided, and that no border can be fixed between great and small. I have heard it said, the man of the course has no reputation, perfect virtuosity achieves nothing, the great man has no fixed identity, for he holds perfectly to the differing allotment of things. The river god said, from within things or without, where is the standard that can divide the more from the less valuable, the great from the small? Rua of the Northern Sea said, from the point of view of the course, no thing is more valuable than any other. But from the point of view of itself, each thing is itself worth more and all the others are worth less. And from the point of view of convention, the value of things is not determined by themselves. From the point of view of their differences, if we consider something big because it is bigger than something else, no thing is not big. If we consider it small because it is smaller than something else, no thing is not small. When you can understand the sense in which heaven and earth are just like a grain of rice and the tip of a hair is just like a mountain range, you have grasped the principle of their differences. If we consider something to be worthy because it has some positive effectiveness, there is no thing that is not worthy. If we consider it to be unworthy because there is some positive effectiveness it lacks, there is no thing that is not unworthy. When you understand the sense in which East and West are opposed to each other and yet indispensable to each other, you have clarified the allotments of their positive effects. From the point of view of the inclinations of various beings, if we consider something right because someone considers it right, then no thing is not right. If we consider it wrong because someone considers it wrong, then no thing is not wrong. When you understand the sense in which Yao and Jia each considers himself right and the other wrong, you have grasped the operation of their inclinations. In olden times, Yao yielded the throne to Shun and Shun became a true emperor, but Kui yielded the throne to Ji and Ji was destroyed. Tang and Wu fought for the throne and became rulers, but Bo Gong fought for the throne and perished. From this point of view, the propriety of struggle or of yielding, the conduct of a Yao or a Jia is given different values at different times, none of which can be taken as a constant. Pillars and cross beams can be used to ram down a wall, but not to plug a hole, for this requires a different kind of tool. A great stallion can gallop a thousand miles in a day, but it cannot catch mice as well as a cat, for that requires a different kind of skill. Kites and owls can catch a flea or discern the tip of a hair on a dark night, but in the daytime they are blinded and cannot even make out a mountain range, for that requires a different inborn nature. So if someone says, why don't we make only rightness our master and eliminate wrongness, make only order our master and eliminate chaos, this is someone who has not yet understood how heaven and earth fit together and the way the 10,000 things really are. That would be like taking heaven alone as your master and eliminating earth, or taking in alone as your master and eliminating yang, an obvious impossibility. If someone nonetheless insists on talking this way, he is either a fool or a swindler. 
The rulers of the three dynasties sometimes yielded their thrones and sometimes passed them on to their sons. Those who did either at the wrong time contravening the current conventions were called usurpers, while those who did either at the right time in accord with current conventions were called righteous men. Silence, river god, silence. How could you know which gateways lead to worthiness and which to worthlessness, or which allegiances make one the greater or the lesser? The river god said, but then what should I do? What should I not do? How shall I decide what to accept, what to reject, what to pursue, what to avoid? Rua of the Northern Sea said, from the point of view of the course, the reciprocal overflowings of things are such that nothing can be definitively called worthy or unworthy. So do not restrict your will, but expansively limp and stagger along with the course. The fading and blooming of things is such that nothing can be definitively called greater or lesser. So do not unify your conduct, but be uneven and varied along with the course. Severe, like the ruler of a state, such as its unbiased virtuosity. Giving forth continuously like a festival centered around its shrine, such are its unbiased blessings. Extensive, like the endlessness of the four directions, such as its limitlessness. Methodless, in no definite location, it embraces all things, giving special protection to none. Leveling all things into one, what is long or short? The course has no end or beginning while creatures are born and die, coming to no reliable completion. Now empty, now full, things do not remain positioned in any one fixed form. The years cannot be held on to, time cannot be stopped. Waxing and waning, filling and emptying, each end is succeeded by a new beginning. This is a way of describing the method by which they are in the greatest sense just right for their position, the way all things fit together. The becoming of things is like a galloping horse, transforming with each movement, altering at each moment. What should you do? What should you not do? You will in any case be spontaneously transforming. The river god said, in that case, what value is there in the course? Rua of the Northern Sea said, when you understand the course, you will be able to see through to the way things fit together, and then you will certainly understand what is appropriate to each changing situation. This will keep you from harming yourself with things. A man of perfect virtuosity can enter fire without feeling hot, enter water without drowning. Neither heat nor cold can harm him, the birds and animals do not impinge upon him. This is not to say that he treats these things lightly, but rather precisely that he discerns where there is danger, remains calm in both good and bad fortune, is cautious about what he flees and what he approaches. Thus, nothing can harm him. Hence it is said, the heavenly is internal while the human is external and virtuosity resides in the heavenly. He who knows which activities are of the heavenly and which are of the human roots himself in the heavenly and positions himself comfortably in whatever he attains from it. Advancing and retreating, shrinking and expanding according to the time, he returns always to the most constrained but can thereby be described as reaching the expanse of the ultimate. The river god said, what do you mean by the heavenly and what by the human? Rua of the northern sea said that cows and horses have four legs is the heavenly. The bridle around the horse's head and the ring through the cow's nose are the human. Hence it is said, do not use the human to destroy the heavenly, do not use the purposive to destroy the fated, do not sacrifice what you have attained from heaven for the sake of mere names. Hold on to this carefully, for then you can return to what is genuine in you. The unipede envied the millipede, the millipede envied the snake, the snake envied the wind, the wind envied the eye, and the eye envied the mind. The unipede said to the millipede, hopping around on my single leg, I managed to get from place to place, but it requires all my skill. And yet you were somehow able to manage 10,000 legs at the same time. How do you do it? The millipede said, it's not like that. Haven't you ever seen a person spit? He gives a hawk and all at once the big globules come flying forth like innumerable pearls and the little droplets go spreading out like mist, raining down in a tangle. In my case, all I do is set my heavenly impulse into action, I have no idea how it's done. The millipede said to the snake, I can move along on all these feet of mine, but it is still no match for the way you do it with no feet at all. But how? The snake said, how could the motions of the heavenly impulse be altered? What use would I have for feet? 
The snake said to the wind, I move along by putting my spine and flanks into action, at least there seems to be something there doing it. But you come whooshing up from the northern sea and all at once you are whooshing off into the southern sea as if there is nothing there doing it at all. How do you do it? The wind said, true, I can whoosh up from the northern sea and just as suddenly into the southern sea, but whoever so much as points a finger or raises a foot at me immediately defeats me. Nonetheless, I alone am capable of snapping massive trees in two and tossing whole houses into the sky. I use all my small defeats to make one great victory. But the really great victory of this kind is something accomplished only by the sage. When Confucius traveled to Kuang, the people of Song surrounded him in multiple ranks, and yet he went on singing and strumming his strings without pause. Zilu, going in to see him, asked, How can you be so happy, master? Confucius said, Come, I will tell you. I've been trying to avoid failure for such a long time, and yet here it is, that is fate. I've been seeking success for so long, and yet it still eludes me, that's due to the times we live in. In the days of Yao and Shun, no one in the world was a failure, but this was not gained due to any wisdom on their parts. In the days of Jie and Zhou, no one in the world was a success, but this was not because of any failure of their wisdom. It was just the circumstantial tendencies of the times that made it so. To travel over water without fearing the sharks and dragons is the courage of the fishermen. To travel over land without fearing rhinos and tigers is the courage of the hunter. To view death as no different from life even when the blades are clanging in front of one's face is the courage of the warrior. And to know that success depends on fate and failure on the times to face great calamities without fear, this is the courage of the sage. Relax, Zulu. My fate is already sealed. A short while later, a soldier came in with a message saying, We surrounded you because we thought you were Yanghua. Since we have realized our mistake, we ask leave to yield way to you and withdraw. Gong Sun Long said to Prince Mao of Wei, When I was young, I studied the course of the former kings. When grown, I came to understand the practice of humanity and responsibility. I could combine the same and the different, separate, hard, and white, make the not so appear so, and the unacceptable appear acceptable. I had confounded the wisdom of all the philosophers and stopped the mouths of all the debaters. I thought I already understood everything. But now that I have heard Zhuangzi's words, I am bewildered and lost in their strangeness. Does his rhetorical skill surpass mine? Is my knowledge unequal to his? At this point, I barely know how to open my beak. Please explain this to me. Prince Mao leaned against his low table, breathing deeply, then looked up at the skies and laughed. Have you never heard the story about the frog in the sunken well? He said to the tortoise of the Eastern Ocean, how happy I am. I jump about on the railings and beams of the well and rest on the ledges left by missing tiles along its walls. When I splash into the water, it supports my armpits and holds up my chin, and when I tread in the mud, it submerges my feet up to the ankles. The surrounding crabs and tadpoles are certainly no match for me. For to have such mastery over one whole puddle of water like this, possessing all the joy of this sunken well, that is perfection. Why don't you come in and have a look sometime? But before the tortoise could even get his left foot in, his right knee was stuck in the opening. So he pulled himself back out and told the frog about the ocean. Its vastness exceeds a distance of a thousand miles, its depth is beyond the measure of a thousand fathoms. In Yu's time the lands were flooded for nine years, but its waters did not rise. In Tang's day there were seven droughts in eight years, but its shores did not recede. Unpushed and unpooled by either a moment or an aeon, unreceded and unadvanced by either little or much, that is the great joy of the Eastern Ocean. When the Wellfrog heard this, he was cast into uncontainable astonishment, shrinking into utter discouragement. Now, for the intellect, which doesn't know how to handle even the ultimate reaches of affirmations and negations, to contemplate the words of Zhuangzi, that is like a mosquito trying to carry a mountain on its back or an inchworm trying to scurry across the Yellow River. It cannot be done. Your intellect, not knowing how to make sense of these most wondrous words of his, instead taking delight in its own momentary gains, is it not a frog trapped in the sunken well of right and wrong? 
As for him, he is no sooner traipsing across the yellow springs than he is climbing through the blue of the heavens, free of both south and north, unobstructed and released in all the four directions, submerged in the unfathomable depths. Devoid of both east and west, he begins anew in the dark obscurity and returns to the great openness. For you to rigidly seek him out with your acute discernment, searching for him with disputations, why, that's just like trying to survey heaven through a tube or to measure the depth of the earth with an awl. Isn't it just too small? You'd best simply forget about it and go your way. Haven't you heard about how Yuzi of Shoaling tried to learn the walking style of Handan? Before he was able to master this local skill, he had forgotten his original gait and had to return home on his hands and knees. If you don't get out of here, you might lose your original skills and be left without a career. Gong Sun Long, unable to close his mouth or retract his tongue, broke into a run and bolted away. Zhuangzi was once fishing beside the Pu River when two emissaries brought him a message from the King of Chu. The king would like to trouble you with the control of all his realm. Zhuangzi, holding fast to his fishing pole without so much as turning his head, said, I have heard there is a sacred turtle in Chu already dead for 3,000 years, which the king keeps in a bamboo chest high in his shrine. Do you think this turtle would prefer to be dead and having his carcass exalted or alive and dragging his backside through the mud? The emissary said, alive and dragging his backside through the mud. Wangzi said, get out of here. I too will drag my backside through the mud. When Huizi was prime minister of Liang, Zhuangzi went to see him. Someone said to Huizi, Zhuangzi is coming, he wants to take your place as prime minister. Huizi was terrified and ordered a search for Zhuangzi throughout the land for three days and three nights. Zhuangzi, when he got there, said to him, in the south there is a bird called Yuanchu, have you heard about it? This bird rises from the southern sea and flies to the northern sea, resting only on the Straculia tree, eating only the fruit of the bamboo and drinking only from the sweetest springs. An owl who had found a rotten mouse carcass saw Yuanchu passing overhead and screeched, Shu. Shu. Now you, are you trying to shoo me away from your state of Liang? Zhuangzi and Huizi were strolling along the bridge over the Hao River. Zhuangzi said the minnows swim about so freely following the openings wherever they take them. Such is the happiness of fish. Huizi said you are not a fish, so whence do you know the happiness of fish? Zhuangzi said you are not I, so whence do you know I don't know the happiness of fish? Huizi said, I am not you, to be sure, so I don't know what it is to be you. But by the same token, since you were certainly not a fish, my point about your inability to know the happiness of fish stands intact. Zhuangzi said, let's go back to the starting point. You said, whence do you know the happiness of fish? Since your question was premised on your knowing that I know it, I must have known it from here, up above the Hao River.